Um, this is uh, part two um, of our mini series of Stuart Soundbites, um, which is specially tailored for property and financial affairs deputies. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined again by Mark Holt, who is the COO of Frankel Topping. Um, Mark is an IFA and an expert to the court advising on forms of award. Um, hopefully most of you have seen the last episode that we did. <clears throat> Um, if you, which was two weeks ago, if you haven't seen it, it's online, you just Google it and you'll find it um, and you can have a watch and, and this is kind of a follow on, but it doesn't matter if you haven't seen it. Um, so today, Mark, Mark, I wanted, first of all, hello and welcome. Thank you so yeah, much for thanks. coming back. Thanks, Emma. Nice to be back. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm like you. I'm also complaining about the heat. I'm melting. I'm, well, I'm glad you're not too traumatised by our last session and you've come back, so thank you. Um, I wanted to start off on a question that we received after the last session, because we talked a little bit about the discount rate mm. um, in our, our last session, and by a little, I mean a lot. Um, but I wanted to, to pick up on the question that we received, which was whether there's likely to be an imminent change to the discount rate. Have you have you got any insider goss on this part? <laughs> <laughs> Some things uh, I may be able to tell you, other things I might not be able to tell you. Um, interesting question. Uh, let me, uh, for those that weren't part of the last week or didn't join in or haven't had the chance to see it, let's have a very quick two minute whistle stop tour of the discount rate. So 2001 to 2017, it was 2.5%. Liz Trust set the cat amongst the pigeons in 2017 by dropping it down to negative 0.75%. Um, then went to a whole load of consultations and it got amended um, from the 5th of August onwards. Um, announced by David Gogg, who is the um, Secretary of State um, and Lord Chancellor, uh, then in July, for it to be amended by the 5th of August 2019, down to negative 0.25%. Not going to, uh, sorry, negative, um, yeah, it went from negative 0.75%, of course, to negative 0.25%. Yeah. Not going to go into the way, all the reasons for that today again, because we covered that quite a lot last time. Uh, and some people made some very nice comments about the fact that it seemed to, an awful lot of time reading Ogden. And that's not the case, by the way. Um, but, uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's really interesting because that, that shift from negative 0.75% to negative 0.25% um, saved the defendant insurance industry around about 300 million pounds. So mm -hmm. that's how significant it was, just that movement from that point. And it's probably been interesting, really interesting just to read you the statement that David Gogg made because it leads on to the question about if is it going to be reviewed? So he said, it is vital that victims of life-changing injuries receive the correct compensation. I'm certain that this is the most balanced and uh, fair approach following extensive consultations. He then went on to say, and this is the really interesting bit that people should probably turn their mind to, Gad provided an analysis of dual rates, which he said at the time was very interesting, um, but didn't consider it appropriate for consideration for setting of that rate at that point due to a lack of quantity and depth of evidence. Well, I've read all the paperwork that came out. I've read the technical memorandum. We contributed to all the consultations. They had lots of information on this. Um, and in fact, the setting of one rate, which you know, we've had this conversation lots of times, Emma, and many people have seen me lecture on this subject. The setting of one rate doesn't suit all needs. And even in their own analysis, so for those that haven't had the opportunity to read all the government um, information, that whole setting of the rates, assuming a low level of investment risk, assuming you're going to get 3.8% gross return, was on the analysis of a 43-year time horizon. What mm -hmm. they did say was that if you were investing over a 10-year time horizon, that the rate that you would expect it to be returned to you under the same assumptions would be 1% less. So by their own admission, the government actuarial department has um, already highlighted to the government that if you've got 10 years, your discount rate should actually be minus 1.25% and not minus 0.25%. Because they're saying over 10 years and less, you're going to get much less time horizon. You're not going to get 3.8%, you're only going to get 2.8%. Mm -hmm. So it leads on to the review. How often are they going to do review? The whole point of it was the fact that you've gone from 2001 to 2017 with no change, that yeah. where the industry was crying out for the change. Yeah. They've said now that from the setting of the latest, from the last rate, so now from 5th of August 2019, that the new rate or the review of the new rate will have to be concluded within a five year period and that the Lord Chancellor will need to refer to the Government Actuarial Department and an advisory panel. So the interesting thing is, so by the very latest, the rate could change. I'm not saying it is going to change, but the rate could change uh, at the latest by the 5th of August 2024. However, the Lord Chancellor can choose. You've got to bear in mind, David Gork made all these statements and then lost his job. 
mm-hmm. before the vacancy came into effect in Boris's yeah. cabinet reshuffle. So it's now the Right Honourable Robert Buckland who picks up the responsibility for the rate changing. And he could, at any given point, long before 2024, look at changing the rate. Now, whether that is a singular rate, a dual rate, or as I've talked about before, lots of times a variable rate, depending on various um, time periods, that remains to be seen. The only thing I can tell you is that I've had a number of conversations recently with a number of government departments and I've also been consul- um, having consultations with the Institute Faculty of Actuaries, who would be one of the expert panel if yeah. they were looking at changing the rate. Um, and that's relatively hot off the press. So the, the, my opinion is, is the rate going to change? I can't tell you one way or the other, because I think that's um, a bit foolhardy to actually nail your flag to the post by saying it's going to change. It could change to this or it could be. I don't know. But um, investigations are certainly afoot as to looking at alternative methods of setting the discount rate. Right, okay. Well, we'll keep our eyes peeled. Um, it's hard to be optimistic about, about the discovery. It feels that wait, you know, that huge long wait was just forever, it was such such a long time coming. Um, and mm-hmm. I want to ask you more questions about the discount rate, Mark, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to because mm-hmm. we've got other things to talk about. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit today is about due diligence. Um, and this is a question we um, received from um, a deputy who asked, you know, what type of um, due diligence procedures should a deputy um, be undertaking prior to um, choosing and instructing an IFA? Mm. OK, um, there's lots of uh, due diligence processes one should look at, but if we just take a step back and just for the listeners, remind ourselves, because there'll be listeners to this who obviously aren't deputies who don't know anything about deputyship standards. So the Office for the Public Guardian issue deputyship standards, and there's five of them, but it's the first one that is actually particularly pertinent to this question. And the first one, so standard number one, is how to secure the client's finances and assets. So uh, standard one, category A, subsection five, a little bit technical, I know, but it's important to understand what it says. It says, seek independent financial advice to maximise the return on the client's savings, investments and any other assets. Key word in there, independent. And then uh, standard 1B, subsection 3, which is about annual reviews, says, carry out reviews of savings and investment portfolios at least once a year. Seek expert and independent advice when necessary. Now, one would suggest if you're doing a review a year later, you go back to the same independent person who gave you the advice in the first instance. There's also some SRA rules around this. So there's changing SRA rules with regards to firms should have a due diligence process in place and they should be able to evidence whatever due diligence process they've done on a one-off basis, but also on an ongoing basis. So for someone coming new into this, I think there's a really interesting starting point is the role of the IFA, which we, which we touched a little on last week, oh, I keep saying last week, the week before, but if, if I keep saying last week, you just have to forgive me because it only feels like a week's gone by. Um, so we touched on it last time. We spoke about the role of the independent financial advisor in the process for the deputy. And I really want to emphasise how important that is. It's actually in the OPG standards and it's actually now guidance from the SRA that you should be going to an independent. Their job it is to hold the investment houses accountable. And I think, you know, the, there's things we might talk about a little later on in the minimal time that we've got where that'll become evident as to why that's important. But if you're completely new to it, then some of the stuff you maybe should be looking at is you know, reputational of the IFA that you're going to. You know, how long have they been around? How long have they been uh, specialising in that market space? And this is not a big plug for Franklin Topping. That's not what this is about at all, because there's lots of reputable IFAs in this market space who have got longevity and experience of working in this field. So I think that's the starting point. You know, who is it? who's the company that you're going to and what experience have they got? Many of us, in fact, lots of the people that work at Franklin Topping have got first-hand experience of personal injury and members of the family who have got clinical negligence. So you also get a real amount of empathy then in the fact that you're dealing, people are dealing with um, situations that they have first-hand experience of. So there's those, um, you know, there are also independent bodies that you can go to. So there's uh, businesses like Moody's who do independent reviews of financial advisors. And so some of the things that they might look at are, you know, regulatory checks. You know, what's the complaints record like from the firm you're going to go to with the FCA, which is our regulator? Financial Conduct Authority. You know, what is the service and independence? So going back to that independence statement I made, they used to be called tied agents. You either used to be an independent financial advisor or tied. 
they've, ne- they've now re- re- modeled that or renamed it. You're either an independent or you're restricted. Right. And you can add restricted means that you just can't go to whole of the market. You haven't got access to go to the whole of the market. You can, you've got a restricted product line or a, a restricted number of providers. And therefore, you cannot say that you're independent in the marketplace. That's not to say, by the way, that some restricted advisors are not very good at what they do, but they are restricted by definition. And, the, and our regulator says they're not independent. And your OPG guidelines themselves are saying, make sure you go to someone who's independent. So that's the first flag I'd say to someone, just make sure that you go into uh, someone who is actually truly independent to give you a whole of market review. Then they'd look at client track record. You know, we boast our client track record and our uh, retention of clients. And because we're PLC, everything we do is in the public domain. We boast a 99% retention of clients. It's really important because it certainly means that we're doing something right with the clients because we don't lose them. So that's, and that's data that any prospective firm that you're wanting to do some business with should have at their fingertips to actually sell their wares to, to you as a, as a deputy, you might want to use them. Um, and then you're looking at the, the composition of the team, you know, how many power planners are there, how many um, consultants are there, what's the qualifications like. Um, and then there's a real fluffy one at the moment, which is taking a lot more uh, impetus and people take, sitting up and taking a lot more stock. I know we joked a little earlier about the weather, but I watched a documentary earlier the night about global warming. And it's all about this environmental and social governance and awareness. Um, you know, what's your carbon footprint? There is no doubt about it, given the fact that China's just had 12 months worth of rain in two days. That is a seismic shift in um, weather events, brought about, can only be explained by global warming. So it's that mm-hmm. kind of carbon footprint and, you know, what, do the, um, what are the, the principles of the firm that you might be wanting to engage with with regards to that and other areas? So th- there's lots to consider. Um, when looking at you know who who would be the right company and or the right advisor within that company. Yeah, and I suppose for for solicitors we've got you know legal five hundred and chambers and partners we've got you know guides like that you can go to. Um, from what you're saying, this requires some digging, some researching, and as you say, covering all of those kind of bases. Um, mm. what um so. It, Moving on from that a wee bit, let's assume we've instructed somebody. So yeah. how, how does a deputy then go about kind of challenging and, and comparing investment performances in their clients, kind of the best interests? OK, well, that's where then you really do rely heavily on your independent financial advisor. And that's why you need someone who's independent. Because yeah. if, if you are a deputy coming to us um, as a new deputy, but you've got an existing client bank and book of, business with other discretionary fund managers and or other IFAs who may not have been giving you a good service and you're just looking to benchmark kind of the performance you've been getting that's where you need the IFA because the IFA will be the independent go-between that yeah. you know we um, and one of my colleagues has pioneered for quite a number of years very successfully a course of protection um, report uh, and Ian's been very successful with this um, and in effect what what he does and what we've now um, embodied in a, in a professional service offering that we, that we sell is that we will take a holistic view of somebody else's portfolio. But it's not so we remain on complete independence. And this is the important thing. It's not just Essential, which is a group company business view on it. We actually go to people like Brooks McDonald, SEI, 7IM, Canaccord, lots of other independent businesses the discretionary fund management businesses, and ask them their opinion. And what we're looking to do when you're trying to look at the performance or the composition is, you know, how far out of kilter has that portfolio now gone to the clients, what they perceived was their risk profile. And I did one not so long ago where the deputy believed that their portfolio was running at a risk level four. And we did, a, uh, we did a, an analysis of that portfolio, both internally and externally, pulled it all together into quite a complex report they showed that actually the portfolio was running at a risk level seven, that the volatility was off the scale and that that, that portfolio desperately needed to be moved. Uh, if worst case scenario would be balanced, but clearly the discretionary fund management business had not taken any concerns over slipping out of um, asset allocation. Um, and that is what you're paying an independent for. We yeah. have access to analytical software. So we use FE analytics an awful lot. And what that allows us to do uh, is put in any other funds that are in the marketplace and they're about just so everyone's aware there's about twenty thousand investment funds available at this moment in time uh, and they're actually in, independent funds that you can buy so the marketplace is huge yeah but most of those you can actually get some comparison on and we run it uh, on fe analytics and we can show 
an existing portfolio versus a number of other portfolios out there, including one of our own, if we were in a pitch to try and win the business. Um, and that's where the independence and the access to the um, analyzing tools is absolutely crucial. I was going to ask you about um, how to draw the distinction between when maybe there's been a bad year or you know a bad year with perform investment performance or whether and whether or whether it, there's a sign that you should be moving on from an yeah. IFA or DFM and um, from what you've said that that's your your IFA should be you should know it should be clear is that is that fair to say uh yes and no um okay. it, it, because those IFAs amongst us that will remember going back many years it used to be a thing called the pinks and you used to go through the pinks papers and look at the fund performance. And it was based on the quarter. And you say, well, this fund's performing really well. It's in quartile one for uh, quarter one, two, and three. But it didn't do too well in quarter four. And that's how advisors used to put portfolios together and a, a combination of different funds. That all changed dramatically you know, with the onset of software and um, you know, online tools. But we also subscribe now to ARC, to Asset Risk Consultancy. So all our data is uploaded to, to that, along with lots of our competitors and lots of other funds out there. And the idea of ARC is it produces a benchmark. So the benchmark is across the spectrum saying that on average, for somebody at that list level, prepared to accept that amount of volatility, that's the sort of performance you should have received over the last 12 months, 36 months, and 60 months. Yeah. And you get plotted on a chart against everyone else. So it becomes very easy to see where is the line of best fit on performance and is your current, your current investment solution above or below that line? Yeah. Now, it do, just because it might be at the point that you're analysing it below the line doesn't mean it's a bad performing fund because there are a lot of other factors to, to, to get, take into consideration. But like I said to you last time we spoke, you know, if you look at last year, no one expected the stock markets globally to drop, in some cases, 35% and yeah. more. Yeah. Um, and that was just a bad year. But by the end of the year, the markets had all priced back in all the bad news, had a much more positive forward-looking um, uh, outlook um, because they believe that AstraZeneca and Pfizer would do exactly what they've proven to do, which has then enabled the worldwide uh, business trades to open back up. So you can't just say it's a bad year. You've got to compare it against lots of other things. Yeah. Okay. And um, final question, Mark, because as always, we're running low on time, but um, yeah. we, uh, I think this is probably the biggest question, so it's unhelpful that it's the last, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk a wee bit about kind of the key considerations for a deputy to take into account when they're deciding upon best investment route and whether that's a question for the deputies ultimately and and how how to know whether onshore uh, versus offshore investments are a good idea. Yeah, well, that is a big question. Um, <laughs> and I've, I've got less than two minutes to answer that. So I, I, I'm not going to be able to answer all that question. I, I will uh, you know, reiterate what I said last time. Deputies are particularly good at what they do. Um, not all deputies, you know, but most deputies that we deal with, um, that we have very close relationships with, they're absolutely superb. That's what they're trained, qualified and educated in. Um, to be making decisions on which is the best investment house, that's the job of an IFA. So yeah. people should just, you know, engage with people. It's not a matter of cost. Quite often engaging with an IFA will actually save you more cost in the long run than actually not engaging with an IFA because that brings us very neatly on to whether you go offshore uh, or offshore or onshore. Right. Um, and there are a lot of practitioners in our market space and un unfortunately do not understand uh, or do not buy into the real benefits of investing offshore when appropriate. So there's a fundamental difference and it's, it's way beyond the scale of today to actually go into the pros and cons of offshore versus onshore. Yeah. But when you are talking about large loss investments, so large loss um, forms of the world where the deputy has got a significant sum of money to invest on behalf of the client, you should not be engaging someone to advise you on that money if they don't understand or cannot put into practice what we're all educated in through our training, which is offshore bond planning, because the tax advan advantageousness of an offshore bond over being onshore, the flexibility, the fact that you don't pay any CGT in an offshore bond, given the fact some of the comments are made last week or week before with regards to the upcoming increases in tax for investments. So the fact that there's far more flexibility you can have with your investment. And we run a report all done through a very bespoke cash flow modeling tool that was designed by very clever chartered accountants, far, far more intelligent than I, who designed this software that you can actually compare. And I'm going to use a round number, five million pounds, let's say, 
if you invest five million pounds onshore and just take advantage of an on onshore with some ices, or you invest maybe one million pounds onshore but four million pounds offshore, how much and if all of the things being equal, how long will the money last for, and how mm. much tax will paid at the end of it? And unless you've got someone who can actually demonstrate this to you, then you need to be very wary of dealing with advisors who don't understand what the advantages truly are to your um, client uh, yeah. of using offshore bonds. Yeah, there's a lot to think about. Mark. <laughs> there's a, just there a is. few points to think about, and we can't possibly cover it all in this session, but the point of this is to give everyone a bit of a taste of the types of issues to start thinking about. Thank you ever so much um, for, for tuning in today, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh